Today on From His Heart, Pastor Jeff Shreve continues his practical new series called It's Not Easy Being Me. And today's encouraging lesson is for those who feel like they've failed too many times in life. You'll find new hope in this lesson called When You Don't Measure Up. I want to speak to you this morning on this subject, when you don't measure up. I can remember it like it was yesterday, my first day in first grade. Can anybody remember your first day in first grade? I went to Catholic school, and so I had a white shirt on because we had uniforms, and I had this white shirt and these salt and pepper pants and new shoes, first day of first grade. I was excited, and I was nervous altogether. My mom made me a sack lunch along with my other brothers and sisters. I'm the fifth of six kids, and so I had a sack lunch. And then she got me, of all things, to take first day of first grade, my dad's old briefcase. Who takes a briefcase to first grade? I mean, I, I, she should have gotten me a hat that just said nerd alert, nerd alert. <laughs> so here I'm, I'm going into first grade with my briefcase and my lunch and my new shoes and, you know, sit down there. And I sat next to Timmy Fragulia. He was the first guy I met in first grade. And I was thinking, man, I hope Timmy likes me because I'm nervous. And, and I could tell he was nervous too. And, and you know, uh, what was going on in my little six-year-old heart and mind is, do I have the stuff that it takes to make it in first grade? Can I keep up with the other first grade fat cats, you know? And, and you're just kind of nervous because I've never been in first grade before. And you're wondering to yourself, do I have what it takes can I measure up? Hey, we're in a series called It's Not Easy Being Me. And today we want to look at that subject about measuring up. You know, thinking and wondering and, and uh, agonizing over that question, do I measure up here in this group, in that group, in this profession, in that profession, in this class, in that class, on this team, on that team, that kind of feeling, it's rooted in insecurity. Now, the dictionary definition for insecurity is this. It's uncertainty or anxiety about yourself. Not confident about yourself or your ability, a lack of assurance. When we're insecure, we lack assurance in who we are and what we're able to do and how we can function in certain arenas. And the truth of the matter is this, many, many people struggle with insecurity. They're not going to tell you because that would make them vulnerable. But you can tell that they're insecure. You know, some of the most insecure people are the people who always brag on themselves. We think that person's a braggart. That person just is so stuck on himself. Typically, when somebody has to tell you how great they are, it's because they don't think they're very great. And they're trying to build themselves up in your eyes so you would think that they have esteem uh, because they don't feel it very much. Lots of people struggle with insecurity, struggle with this thought that they don't measure up, that they're not good enough, they're not smart enough, they're not cool enough, that they, they, they just don't have what it takes. And although they try and try and try and try, it just doesn't seem to be enough. Now, that may describe you. Hey, I deal with this thing called, do I measure up? I have to fight that in my own life. We've been talking about personality types and temperaments, and certain temperaments are more geared toward that uh, I feel inadequate type of 
problem. You know who dealt with feeling inadequate, who dealt with this insecurity? He dealt with it and conquered it, I believe. But I believe the Apostle Paul dealt with this feeling of not measuring up. This is what he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the great chapter on the resurrection. And as we read the chapter in the resurrection, the first 10 verses, we get insight into what Paul thought of himself. Now I make known to you, Paul says in verse 1, brethren, the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, in which also you stand, by which also you're saved, if you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. You want to know what the gospel is? He starts it in verse 3. This is the gospel that he preached. For I have delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas. Cephas is the Aramaic name of Peter. Cephas means rock. And so he appeared to Cephas. We know him more as Peter. Peter is the Greek name, uh, Petros, of the word rock. He appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. That's what they called the group of the apostles. They called them the twelve. Even though Judas wasn't there anymore, they still called them the twelve. Verse 6, and after that, he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen asleep, some have died. Then he appeared to James... Not the Apostle James, but James, the Lord's half-brother, James, who was the leader of the uh, Jerusalem church, James, who wrote the epistle of James. He appeared to James and then to all the apostles again together. And it says in verse 8, and last of all, who was the last person to see the resurrected Jesus? The Apostle Paul. And last of all, as it were to one untimely born, he appeared to me also. Paul was untimely born because he didn't have that gestation period uh, that the other guys did with Jesus. He wasn't part of the original group that spent three and a half years with Jesus. He was one born out of due time and uh, untimely born, as he puts it here. He appeared to me also. Now, here you go. For I am the least of the apostles who am not fit to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. I don't measure up, Paul said. I'm the least of the apostles. That word least is a superlative in the Greek. That word means smallest in size, smallest in importance, smallest in dignity, smallest in rank, in excellence, excellence, and in the estimation of men. He is the least As one commentator said, less than the least. I mean, he is as low as you can go. I'm the least of all the apostles. I'm not fit to be called an apostle. Fit in terms of character, fit in terms of worthiness, fit in terms of sufficiency. No, Paul, why do you think you're the least of the apostles? Why do you think you're uh, not fit to be an apostle? Because I persecuted the church of God, that's why. Because I was one who was trying to destroy Christianity. Because before I was Paul the Apostle, I was Saul of Tarsus, breathing out threats and murders against the disciples of the Lord. I was the one who came and ravaged the church. I was the one who arrested people and dragged them to prison. I was the one in Acts chapter 7 when they stoned Stephen. I watched all their cloaks. And I was the one who had a big smile on my face and I was clapping as the last stone came and crushed Stephen's skull. That was me. I'm the chief of sinners. I'm a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent aggressor. I'm the least of the apostles. How do you live with yourself, Paul? Verse 10, but by the grace of God... I am what I am. And his grace toward me did not prove vain, but I labored even more than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God with me. How did Paul deal with this thing called insecurity, feeling like you don't measure up, getting together with the other apostles and feeling like you're the, the guy, low man on the totem pole? How do you deal with that? You remember the grace of God. And you know that by the grace of God, I am what I am. Hey, what do you do when you feel as if you don't measure up? 
you remember the grace of God. And you focus in on the grace of God. The grace of God is God's unmerited, undeserved favor towards sinners. It's his undeserved mercy. It's his undeserved love. Somebody has uh, translated the grace of God this way, defined the grace of God this way. It's love in action. The Old Testament doesn't really use the term charis in the New Testament as grace. It doesn't use that term as much as it uses the Hebrew word hesed. The Hebrew word hesed, which is translating love, translated loving kindness, that word is used 175 times in the Old Testament. Never do we find the word loving kindness in the New Testament. What we find in the New Testament is grace. Grace. Jesus came into this world, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. What is, what is grace? Grace is God's loving kindness. I love that word. It, it's God's faithful love mixed in with his wonderful kindness. It's his loving kindness toward undeserving sinners. And Paul said, I am what I am by the grace of God. And his grace had tremendous effect in Paul's life. It was his grace that turned Saul of Tarsus into Paul the apostle. It was God's grace that took the chief of sinners and made him the most used saint in all of the Bible. Maybe Paul is the greatest Christian who ever lived. From the chief of sinners to the greatest of saints. How did that happen? It's by the grace of God. So we want to look today at the grace of God. Because when you don't measure up, you desperately need to think on his grace and receive his grace and live in his grace. I want to share with you two assurances today. See, the person who thinks he doesn't measure up, she doesn't measure up, is an insecure person, is a person who is lacking in assurance. So I want to share with you two assurances today from God's word and from the grace of God. First of all, assurance number one, the grace of God brings eternal life. The assurance of eternal life, the assurance of eternal salvation. Hey, we have lots of people who call themselves Christians who are very insecure when it comes to death and what happens after death. And you ask them a question, you know for sure you'd go to heaven. And they're like, mm, man, I hope so. Uh, maybe so. Guess so. Uh, I just, I'm a little nervous about that one. I don't like it when they preach on that stuff because it makes me nervous. And, and I know I'm supposed to be sure, but I'm just not so sure. And Listen, it's the grace of God that gives you assurance. It's the grace of God that brings eternal life. Ephesians chapter 2, the Lord says it twice. He says in verse 5, for by grace you've been saved. And then he says in Ephesians 2, 8, for by grace you've been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, lest any man should boast. You've been saved by his grace. That's the only way anyone ever gets saved. You don't get saved by your good works. Nobody gets saved by his good works. As Adrian Rogers used to say, you're not saved by your sweat, you're saved by his blood. By his blood. And you didn't do anything to deserve and earn his blood. It's all of grace. It's the unmerited, undeserved favor and mercy and love and kindness and compassion of God. Now, when you think of the grace of God bringing eternal life, you remember this. Eternal life is a free gift. It's a free gift that costs an infinite price. The Bible makes it clear that it's a free gift. When it's a free gift, you don't do anything for it, and that's because of grace. You can't earn grace. You don't deserve grace. So God offers eternal life as a free gift. Romans six twenty three says, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. It's a free gift. Now, when, when we're presented with a free gift, if we're not careful, we can start thinking that the free gift is a cheap gift. Oh, that's just free. You know, uh, we think uh, it can't be very good if it's free. It's not a cheap gift. It's a free gift that costs an infinite price. Scripture says in 1 Peter chapter 1, knowing 
that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your feudal way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood, unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. The Bible calls it precious blood. That means costly blood, valuable blood. It's the most precious thing that God could give for you and me. He gave, and that was his own son. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. If God had paid $100 trillion for you, you say, well, that's a lot of money. Wow, he's putting a big price tag on me. That's nothing for God. The amount of money, God is king of the universe. All the silver, all the gold belong to God. For him to pay $100 trillion is nothing. That doesn't cost God anything. But for him to give his son, that costs. It's precious blood. Eternal life that comes from God's grace is a free gift that costs an infinite price. And God gave his son for you and me. And Jesus gave his life so that you could share in his life. That's grace. I don't deserve God's love. I don't deserve that he would give his son. I definitely don't deserve that Jesus would give his life. But he did give his life so I could share in his life. Now, one of the great, great verses in 2 Corinthians is found in chapter 8, verse 9. It's kind of the gospel in a nutshell. You know, that's what we call John 3, 16, and it's definitely a gospel in, in a nutshell. But this is also, 2 Corinthians 8, 9, is also the gospel in a nutshell. And it says this, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the unmerited favor, the undeserved kindness and love of God, of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, so rich, he was king of kings and lord of lords, he sat on the throne of heaven, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor. Because he loved you, he became poor. Because he loved you, he laid aside his crown and his royal robes, and he stepped down off the throne of heaven, and he came down, down, down to earth, and he was born of an earthly mother. His father was God, but he encompassed himself, the infinite God encompassed himself in a virgin's womb. He was born and laid in a feeding trough because there was no room for them in the inn. He was rich, yet for your sake he became poor. He came into this world for one main reason, that was to die on the cross. Son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. And he took all your sin upon himself and all my sin upon himself and all the sins of all the world. He drank that bitter cup that was before him that he prayed three times, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. And silence from heaven said, my son, there is no other way. And he drank that bitter cup every last drop and he hung naked on a cross for you and for me. And that's grace. Where you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. That though he was rich, yet for your sake, he did it for you. He became poor, so very poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. He gave his life so you could share in his life, so you could share in his riches, so you could share in his love and in his joy and in his peace, and so you could share in his heaven forever and ever and ever, and that's why he did it. The acronym for grace no doubt is birthed out of 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. Grace, God's riches at Christ's expense. That is grace. He who knew no sin became sin for you and me, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. He who is rich, yet for your sake he became poor, that you through his poverty might be made rich. The grace of God brings eternal life. And let me tell you something about eternal life. Eternal life. Life. When you receive Jesus as Savior and Lord, when you turn from your sin, when you truly repent and cry out to Jesus to save you, to save a wretch like you, and you know that you're a sinner and you're lost without him, and you cry out to him, he saves you just like that. And he gives you eternal life, and you can never, ever, ever lose it. We sang that song, no power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand. 
We are kept secure in the hand of God. Now, one of the great verses that Jesus uttered concerning eternal security is found in John chapter 5, verse 24. John 5, 24, Jesus gives the truly, truly statement. There are 25 times in the book of John Jesus gave the truly, truly statement. King James, he says, verily, verily. Literally, what it is in the Greek is amen, amen. It, it, it's like the Lord is saying, hey, pay attention here. This is really, really important. Make sure to get this down. In my Back to the Future joke, it's always, hey, little McFly, you know, is anyone home? Listen to this. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word, and believes him who sent me, believes that the Father sent the Son for my salvation, believes him who sent me, has eternal life and does not, come, does not come into judgment but has passed out of death into life. So what does that say to me? That says when I repent of my sin and I turn and really trust Jesus. Now, I'm not talking about those who are pretenders. I'm talking about those who are for real who really do feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit, who really do put their faith and trust in Jesus and turn from sin and turn to Jesus. When that happens, you have eternal life. And you don't come into the judgment. You pass out of death into life. And that happens like that. I was a high school senior alone in my bedroom when I prayed and asked Jesus to save me, and he did, and I passed out of death into life. And I was given the gift of eternal life. Now, I want you to think about that, eternal life. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in him who sent me has eternal life. Now, how long is eternal life? Lasts well, for eternity. It's eternal, right? It's not a trick question. Who's buried in Grant's tomb? Grant. It's not a trick question. How long is eternal life? Eternal life is forever. So if you had Something from Jesus that you say, well, you know, I've been saved, but then uh, after five years, I kind of petered out and I, I lost my salvation. Well, it doesn't work like that. If you could get saved and five years later lose it, you know what you had? You had five-year life. You had five-year life. How about if you had it 10 years and then lost it? What'd you have? You had 10-year life. How about if you had 30 years and then you lost it? What'd you have? You had 30-year life. When Jesus saves a person, he gives them eternal life. The free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And when you hear his word and believe on him who sent Jesus, you have right now, present tense, eternal life, and it lasts for all eternity. And you don't need to fear losing your salvation and you don't need to, to question, you know, lots of people, did I do it right? I'm not so sure I did it right. You know, I prayed to receive Christ, but I don't know if it was real. I tell people this all the time, you know, folks that are really struggling with, I don't know if Jesus is really in my life. I say, listen, suppose I said to you, you know what? I think I'm going to move into your house. I'm just coming in. I'm bringing my four dogs. I'm coming into your house. But you won't ever notice that I'm there and my dogs are there. They're all inside dogs. You won't notice us. How long would I live with you before you'd notice that I was there? Immediately, you'd notice something's different. Somebody's here. You know, that's a human being coming to live in your house, even if you have a big house. I have a friend of mine. He has a big house, 18,000 square feet. But if I lived with him, he'd eventually know, hey, somebody else is here. You know, I was going to play racquetball, but it's being used by this other guy that's living there. Hey, when the king of kings and lord of lords comes to live inside of your heart, I guarantee you notice it because he comes in to make changes. And you feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit. When God came to live in my life, when the Lord Jesus through his spirit came into my life, I didn't understand it all, but I knew when I went to sin that he, there was something different. There was somebody, I was under new management because the Holy Spirit of God was pointing and, and uh, just, you know, giving me what for in my heart saying, hey, you can't do that. You're under new management here. I live here. And we're not looking at that, and we're not going to participate in that. 
And man, I had never experienced that in my life. And I remember saying to myself, something has changed within me. I had died to my old way of life and I had a brand new life in Jesus. Hey, the grace of God brings eternal life. It changes your hereafter. But the second assurance, the grace of God changes your here and now. It brings not only eternal life, but it brings abundant life. Abundant life. Paul had both eternal life and abundant life. Jesus said in John chapter 10, verse 10, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they might have life and might have it abundantly. I came that you would have life eternal and life abundant. Abundant life means you have a life that's overflowing with the good things of God. Now, Saul of Tarsus met Jesus on the road to Damascus in Acts chapter 9. He saw him. You know, that was one of the qualifications for being an apostle. You had to see the resurrected Christ. Paul was the last one to ever do that. He says, last of all, he appeared to me. Last of all. He hasn't appeared to anybody else. There are no other apostles as there were with Peter and James and John and Philip and Bartholomew. Paul was the last. If anybody tells you, well, I'm apostle so-and-so, they're not. And, and one of the, that's one of the marks of an apostle. He's, he had to see Jesus resurrected Christ. Paul was the last to do that. And the apostles had, had authority and power from the Lord that was different from other people. And so we don't live in that apostolic age anymore. And Saul of Tarsus meets Jesus. He is, puts his faith and trust in Jesus. He is saved and he is commissioned to go and share the gospel before kings. And he was going to suffer for the Lord's namesake. But that was fine because he had eternal life and he had abundant life. And there was joy and there was peace and there was power. Those things that the Lord gives, Paul had those from Saul of Tarsus to Paul, the great apostle. Now, when we think in practical terms, because we, we look at the, the thing about eternal life, and that's what's been preached in, in churches for years and years and years, and that needs to be preached, of how you can come to know Christ. But then for a Christian, it's like, okay, I came to know Christ. How do I grow in this thing called Christianity? And here's the problem that we run into. Many of us, we don't really understand what we got when we received the Holy Spirit, what we got when we got this thing called eternal life. And we don't know that eternal life comes with abundant life. And many, many of us are living so far below what the Lord has for us. So let's unpack that a little bit. What does it mean to have abundant life by the grace of God? It means you no longer have to live with guilt and shame. That's what it means. As we sang today, no fear in life, no guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. No guilt in life. Now, think about what Paul did. Think about how easy it would have been for him to live in guilt and in shame. He persecuted the church of God. Nobody else had a testimony like that that was part of the group, that was part of the twelve. I mean, you had Matthew, the tax collector. They hated him, uh, just his, his profession. But he wasn't killing people. He wasn't dragging them off. He wasn't trying to destroy the church of the living God. Saul of Tarsus was. So it would have been very easy for him to always live in guilt and shame, kind of like in that Nathaniel Hawthorne play, The Scarlet Letter, where you're just always marked. You know, Hester Prynne, had a mark that she had to wear the big red A on her chest for adulteress. Well, Paul could have felt like, well, I have this mark that says, it, it, it's a big B, it says blasphemer. Or, or some days I get to switch it out and then I get a big P, persecutor. Or some days I have a, a V, violent aggressor. And so he's always feeling like I, I, I'm just damaged goods. I definitely don't ever measure up. He didn't live like that. Why? Because of the grace of God. I am what I am by the grace of God. And he didn't have to live in guilt and in shame. It was Paul who wrote in Romans chapter 8, verse 1, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. 
The moment that he put his faith and trust in Christ Jesus, he was placed in Christ Jesus. And in Christ Jesus, there is no condemnation for you or for me. I don't care what you've done. And I love and I go back to this in my own mind over and over and over again. The prostitute in Luke 7 who wept at Jesus' feet, who repented at Jesus' feet. And he said to her, her whose sins were many, and Jesus didn't try and whitewash that. Her sins were many. She had done terrible things. He said, your sins are forgiven. Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Not go in guilt. Not go in shame. Not go and be a second-class Christian. No, go in peace. You receive his forgiveness. He's forgiven you. So you receive that. Acts chapter 10, verse 15 says, what God has cleansed no longer consider unholy. You don't have to live in guilt and shame. Why? Because of the grace of God. Because Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Ah, but here is a problem for all of us. What do you do when the devil comes with his billy club and comes at you and begins to beat you up and beat you down with the sins of your past? Oh, yeah, Jeff, that might be true for other people, but you remember when you did this, Jeff? You remember when you did that, Jeff? Some of you are thinking as I'm talking, you're thinking, yeah, but he doesn't know about my abortion. Maybe it was two, maybe it was three. He doesn't know about my sin. If he knew about my sin, then he wouldn't say I can live free of guilt and free of shame. I don't have to know about your sin, and you don't have to know about my sin. God sees it all, and God knows it all, and the blood of Jesus, God's son, is able to wash white as snow. So let me have you write down this to remember. When the devil tries to beat you up over guilt and shame, you remember this little acronym, A-R-P. A, acknowledge. You acknowledge. When the devil says, yeah, but look what you did, you acknowledge and say, you know what? That's right, I did that. I did that. Hey, uh, the devil could have said to Paul, hey, Paul, you're a blasphemer and a persecutor and violent aggressor. Here, let me put that patch on your chest so that everybody knows how terrible you are, how awful you are. The devil comes at us that way just as he came at Paul that way. You acknowledge it. Yeah, that's right. I did that. And then R, you remember. You remember what Jesus did on the cross. He hung naked in agony and blood. His blood was shed for that sin, for those sins. And his blood washes white as snow. I remember, yes, I committed that, and Jesus died for that. And then you praise him. You praise him that he paid the price for that sin, and you can live no guilt in life, no fear in death. We sing that song from time to time, it is well with my soul the third stanza says this, my sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole, has been nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, oh, my soul. He's taken it all away. As far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. Man, it's all because of the grace of God. That's abundance when I don't have to live with this heavy coat of guilt everywhere I go. I'm just second class. I don't measure up because, uh, man, if they knew what I had done, then they would hate me, and I hate me. And the Lord doesn't hate you. The Lord loves you, and he paid for all of that. And the devil tries to put the coat on you. You throw the coat off, and you remember. Acknowledge what you've done. Yes, remember the cross and praise him for it. Secondly, you don't have to live trying to earn God's acceptance. Because of the grace of God, I don't have to live anymore trying to earn God's acceptance, trying to be good enough for God to accept me, for God to love me, for God to want to be around me. Many have the testimony of growing up in a home where their acceptance from mom and dad was based on performance. Performance-based acceptance. And performance-based acceptance says if you perform right, if you do well in school, if you clean your room, if you do well in sports, if you do well in dance, if you do well in drill team, if you do well in band or whatever it might be, then I will accept you. But man, you mess up, 
and your room's a mess and you're mean to your brother and sister, you mess up here, you mess up there, you get bad grades, well, that's doghouse for you. I don't accept you. You are unacceptable. And kids grow up in that household and they learn pretty quickly that I'm accepted based on my performance. Listen, just as an aside, performance is important, but performance doesn't determine acceptance. Debbie and I love our girls, whether they performed or not. They were ours. We, were, we accepted them whether they performed or not. Now, we can be displeased with uh, what they're doing, and there can be consequences for what they're doing, but never for them. It's always on the action. It's never on the person. But we can easily... Uh, internalize it and it's the person and it's like I'm not acceptable unless I'm doing these things before my parents and then they will accept me and some parents do that consciously shun their kids reject their kids withhold love from their kids if they're not performing correctly so we take that over into our relationship with God even as Christians and we think well the only way God will accept me is if I'm doing good If I'm having a quiet time, if I'm having a prayer time, oh, I missed my prayer time this morning. God is probably going to give me the Hong Kong colic. I mean, there are just bad things coming my way because I didn't pray long enough. I didn't study long enough. I I should have given some money to that homeless person, but I didn't, and I'm such a terrible, horrible person, and everything's based on performance, and you think God accepts you because of your performance. He does not. If we had to live with performance-based acceptance before God, Newsflash, nobody's accepted. Nobody's accepted. Paul's not accepted. You're not accepted. I'm not accepted. None of us is accepted. God doesn't accept us that way. He accepts us on the basis of his grace. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 6 says in the New King James, to the praise of the glory of his grace by which he made us accepted in the beloved. We're accepted How? We're accepted in the beloved. The beloved is Jesus. And how are we accepted in the beloved in Jesus? By grace. By grace. I love the story in 2 Samuel chapter 9. It's the story of David and a strange character named Mephibosheth. David, if you remember the story, Saul was the first king in Israel. Saul was head and shoulders above everybody else in Israel. He was the tallest. He was handsome. He, He was, that's our king. And the people followed Saul, but Saul started off good. He, he ended poorly. He was, he was a bust of a king. Saul had a son named Jonathan. He had other children. He had a son named Jonathan. And when they were at the battle of Elah with the Philistines, and Goliath said, I defy the ranks of Israel. Send me a man that we may fight together. The one who should have gone out to fight Goliath was Saul, but he was too afraid. So little David... 15, 16, 17-year-old David, peach fuzz on his chin. He goes out and he fights Goliath with a sling and a stick and he defeats Goliath. And he is then put into the army of Saul because he's a mighty warrior even though he's so young. And he begins to lead the armies to great victories. And the women begin to sing, Saul has slain his thousands and David his tens of thousands. And Saul looked with suspicion on David from the moment he heard that song and he became jealous and paranoid of David. Well, David is the the anointed king. He's the one that's going to follow Saul. And strange as it would be, you know, the, the normal pattern would be Saul is king and then Saul dies and then Saul's son Jonathan would be king. And Jonathan, if there's anybody that should hate David or see David as a threat, would be Jonathan. But Jonathan and David were best buddies. They were best buddies. In fact, they were such good friends that they entered into a covenant together, a blood covenant together, a covenant where you would cut your wrist and the other guy would cut his wrist and you'd put your forearms together and you'd mix your blood together and you say, I will do good to your descendants forever. You're you're my, I'm in covenant with you. And David and Jonathan had a covenant. Well, as time went on, David and Jonathan fell in battle. uh, Jonathan and Saul fell in battle and David was indeed set up as king over all Israel. And in 2 Samuel chapter 9, David says to his servants, is there anyone left of the household of Saul that I may show the kindness of God for Jonathan's sake? And they said, well, there's one kid, Mephibosheth. He's the son of Jonathan. 
He's a crippled kid. He, he, his nursemaid dropped him when he was five years old and his legs broke and they never mended right. He's crippled. He's lame in his legs. He's living in a place called Lodabar, which means place of no pasture. And he was there hiding from David, thinking David would try and kill him because that's what the kings did. If you were part of the old uh, royal line, you would get wiped out because he didn't, the new king didn't want anyone coming in saying, well, wait, I'm of the house of Saul. I'm going to take over. And so when the entourage came to get Mephibosheth, he said, oh, no, oh, no, he's found me. And David's men come and take him, and they bring him before David. And he's afraid. And David said, Mephibosheth, don't be afraid. He said, I'm not going to kill you. I'm here to bless you. I'm here to restore you. You're going to eat at my table. I'm going to give you servants. I'm going to restore the lands that were your father's. And Mephibosheth says this, what are you doing? And why are you doing this for a dead dog like me? That's how he referred to himself, as a dead dog. I mean, as low as you could get, a dead dog. Why would you do this for your servant who is a dead dog? And David said to him, Mephibosheth, I'm not doing this for you. I'm doing this for your father, Jonathan. It has nothing to do with you. I'm not accepting you based on you. I'm accepting you based on Jonathan. How does God accept me? Not based on Jeff Shreve, based on Jesus Christ. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32 says this, and be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as, as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. Why does God forgive me? For my sake? No, for Christ's sake. Because the Father says, yeah, well, when you receive Jesus, you were placed in Jesus, and so I treat you as I would treat my own son. You're in the beloved, and I accept my son, and now I accept you. You don't have to live trying to work for God to be pleased with you. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. And when I'm in Jesus, the father says that about me. This is my son, Jeff, and he is beloved because he's in my son, the beloved. And I may not be pleased with everything he does, but I'm pleased with him because he's my son. My three girls, I'm pleased with my girls. They may not do everything right, but I'm pleased with them because they're mine. And God is pleased with you if you know Christ because you're his. You don't work for acceptance. You work from acceptance, knowing that you're accepted in the beloved. And then lastly, you no longer have to live without power and purpose. Look at verse 10 again. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me did not prove vain. But I labored even more than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God with me. Paul said, you know, I received God's grace, and it blew my doors off. I mean, it changed my whole life. It changed my hereafter, and it changed my here and now. It changed my eternity, and it changed my presence. And there is power now because the Holy Spirit of God lives inside and there is great power when the Holy Spirit comes in. 1 Corinthians 15 is all about resurrection. And the Bible makes it clear in Romans chapter 8 that when you receive Christ, you receive resurrection power. If the Spirit of him who raised Christ Jesus from the dead lives in you, man, there is power there. We can have power to overcome sin. Hey, everybody in this room, we struggle with sin. We struggle with different sins. I heard Ravi Zacharias talking the other day, uh, the great apologist, and he says he was talking about a particular sin. He said, that's not the one I struggle with, but I struggle with other things. Everybody struggles with something, whether it's worry or whether it's jealousy or whether it's pride or whether it's slothfulness or, or whether it's lust, whatever it might be. We all struggle with certain things. But listen, there is power when we come to Christ because of the grace of God and we can take the grace of God and let the grace of God work in us so it's not in vain. Paul said, I didn't get saved and just sit around and do nothing. I labored even more than the rest. I might have been the least of the apostles, but I wasn't the, the uh, least working of the apostles. I worked harder than any of the other. Not I, but the grace of God with me and in me. 
Listen, the Bible says, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. We have a whole movement today called the hyper-grace movement where everything's about grace and nothing's about truth. And people say, well, it doesn't matter how you live. Baloney, it matters how you live. You shall be holy for I am holy. But God doesn't accept me based on the way I'm living. He accepts me based on Jesus. And he, when he comes into my life, he says, all right, now, Jeff, we got a lot of work to do here. You got a lot of issues here, and there's a big mess inside here, and so let's clean it up, and let me help you put your house in order and put your life in order. There is power, and there is purpose. You know, it was a couple of weeks ago when Matt Reynolds talked about Romans chapter 12. I urge you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. This is the way a Christian is supposed to live. He or she gets up in the morning, hits the floor with their knees, says, I'm yours, Lord. I offer myself, Lord, as a living sacrifice. You have purchased me with your blood. I don't belong to me anymore. I belong to you. And so I'm reporting for duty as your servant and as a living sacrifice. Lord, I want you to shine through me. And Lord, I want you to share through me. I want to share the gospel and tell people about the death, burial, and the resurrection of Christ. I want people to see you alive in me. God, I want you to give me boldness. So when I'm in a situation with someone, I will take that scary step and speak to them about Jesus every single day. Hey, we have power because the Holy Spirit lives within us. We have purpose because we're in the Lord's army and we are called to be his witnesses. That is our only reason for being here on this earth is to be his witnesses. And I'm to shine with my life and my job is a ministry wherever you work. It's a ministry. My family is a testimony. That's what it's all about, to labor in the grace of God, so to speak, as Paul did, so it wouldn't be in vain. So you wouldn't be one of those Christians that says, you know, I got saved 40 years ago, and I've grown about a quarter of an inch. I got nothing to show. At the end of my life, when I stand before the judgment seat of Christ, he says, what did you do with what I gave you? I gave you my grace. What did you do with it? I didn't do much with it, Lord. I just kind of sat around. Don't be that guy. Don't be that girl. Be the one that says, you saved me, and I got every day I was asking you, do a deep work in me. Thank you for the grace of God. Thank you for the cross. I praise you, Lord, that my sin, not in part but the whole, has been nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more, and I want to tell that to other people that they can live that way too. Listen, let me close with these two words. There are two words in the Christian life that are critically important. The first word We've talked about at length today. It's the word grace. I've given you many definitions of the word grace. Here's one definition I haven't given you. Grace. It's God's acceptance of you. That's grace. The second key word in the Christian life is faith. Grace is God's acceptance of you, and faith is your acceptance of God's acceptance of you. For by grace are you saved through faith. Hey, what's the cure if you don't measure up? It's to receive and believe the grace of God. My friend, thanks so much for watching today. I trust that the message spoke to your heart. And as we get ready to close today, I wanna ask you to really search within. Do you know for certain that you have a personal relationship with Jesus? That is the most important thing of all. That is what determines heaven or hell. And if you're not sure about that most important question, today's the day to make sure, to drive that stake in the ground and know for certain that you belong to Jesus. This is what you have to do. Just pray a simple prayer from your heart. Lord Jesus, I need you. I know that I'm a sinner and I'm lost and I can't save myself. But Jesus, I believe that you are God in the flesh. I believe that you came down from heaven, you uh, walked this earth, that you lived, that you died on the cross for my sins and you rose again from the dead. And Lord, right now, I open my heart to you. I surrender my all to you. 
come into my life and forgive me of all my sins and be my Lord and my Savior. And Jesus, I promise to follow you all the days of my life. My friend, if you'll pray that kind of prayer and mean it, the Lord will come in and your life will never be the same. I would love to hear from you, to know that you're watching, to know that God is using this broadcast to make a difference in your life, to know that you just prayed that prayer of salvation to receive Christ as Savior and Lord. Please take the time to call that toll-free number on your screen, write me, email me, let me know what's going on and how we can pray for you. You really are important to God, and you're important to us, and we're here for you. From his heart is the viewer-supported broadcast ministry of Dr. Jeff Shreve, who believes that no matter how badly you've messed up in life, God still loves you, and he has a wonderful plan for your life. Find out more at fromhisheart.org. Real truth, real